Hey guys, welcome to my channel. Today we're going to do something a little different. I just kind of want to talk about the live endowment in temples of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Most members of the church, when they go to a temple today, will experience the endowment primarily through a film combined with temple workers who are officiators helping with the ritual aspects of the ceremony. However, there's also in two pioneer temples, the Salt Lake Temple and the Manti Temple, what we informally refer to as a live endowment. And by live, we mean that they use live action. Instead of a film that's portrayed on a big screen using a projector, uh, the Manti and Salt Lake Temple use their temple workers as officiators for the ordinance and actors for these characters. So let's get into it. Let's talk about some of the ways that I think the live endowment is super cool. Today I did go to a live endowment session in the Manti Temple and I had a wonderful experience so I just kind of want to talk about it. Now as of March of this year the First Presidency announced that when they renovate these pioneer temples, Salt Lake, Manti, Logan, St. George, etc., they will be removing the live endowment aspect of the endowment ceremony and replacing it with film. And I want to make it clear from the get-go, I fully sustain the Brethren and I fully support the decisions made by the First Presidency and I believe in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm not here to subvert anything. Um, but I will admit I'm a little sad to see the live endowment go because I, it's just a really special part of my heart. And it wasn't until I went to a live endowment session that I felt like the endowment really clicked for me. Because at the end of the day, the endowment was not designed for film. That is the primary mode that we view the endowment today, but it was never designed that way. It was always designed to be initially a acted out ritual drama. And so I think things make a little bit more sense in that context. So I hope by understanding all the ways that the live endowment is special and precious, we understand just how serious President Nelson is about hastening the work. I should also note that if you haven't received your endowment yet, I would highly recommend you at least watch some of my other videos on temple preparation. Since this discussion is kind of more insider baseball, I'm just going to kind of assume you already know some of the elements of the endowment as I'm talking about certain features within this ceremony. We're going to be doing all of this very respectfully. Elder Bednar said that we should not describe or disclose the symbols or special information we promise not to disclose in the temple. Uh, but we can talk about the basic principles, background, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're going to be following that guidance and making sure that we're respectful in our discussion about the temple today. But I would love to just explore some of the things that are really awesome about the endowment. So in the live action version of the endowment ceremony, live endowment, you'll have temple workers who act as the actors or the characters in the endowment narrative. Um, I've talked about this in my other videos, but the temple endowment is a series of covenants, sacred information, and narrative. Namely, it teaches us the plan of salvation. It starts with creation, fall, atonement, and our return to the presence of our heavenly parents. So in the endowment, we do this through, today we do it through a film. But in 1842, when the endowment was first initiated, the officiators acted as characters in this narrative to help teach these principles. And then that tradition continued all the way through many of the pioneer era temples. And it wasn't until the 1950s that we started to transition into presenting the endowment as a film. And I hope to do another video later on about the history of the endowment. But for today, I just want to talk about the live endowment experience. There are eight characters. There is God the Father, God the Son, Adam, Eve, Satan, Peter, James, and John. These are the characters in the endowment. And like I mentioned on film, these are actors that have uh, costuming, props, sets, music, lighting. In a live endowment, it's a lot more pared down because the ordinance workers are those eight characters. You've got ordinance workers in the temple who play the roles of God the Father, God the Son, Lucifer, Adam, Eve, Peter, James, and John. And those same eight people are the ones who then continue to be the officiators throughout the rest of the ceremony. 
Now in an endowment, you usually need at least two men officiating and two women officiating. And so since there's only one female character in this narrative, there'll be other temple workers in the room as well. But for the most part, you've got those eight characters filling all of the roles. And I love the endowment as a live performance because as I mentioned, this was how it was originally intended to be performed as a ritual drama. Now, if you haven't already, you should check out my video on the endowment as a ritual drama because I'll go into a lot more detail there explaining what a ritual drama is. But a ritual drama is a ceremony or a liturgy or some sort of ritual done through narrative. It's teaching principles through story and music and actors and costuming, etc. And this kind of format was done in antiquity. It was done in ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, ancient Rome, you name it. There are lots of different religions who would have rituals done through story to teach certain principles. And that's essentially what the endowment is. We are here to learn how to return to the presence of God. And we do so by learning what Adam and Eve did. We learn where we came from, what we're doing here, where we're going, uh, because we're learning the history of Adam and Eve, the first parents, but we're also to see ourselves as Adam and Eve. And I really think the live endowment helps us bring that out in a cool way. If we see ourselves as Adam and Eve, this isn't just a story we're seeing about someone else. Instead, this is a story we're seeing about ourselves. And so we are included in this experience more. We can identify more closely with Adam and Eve, respectively, as characters when it's in a live endowment, I feel like, because uh, when you're in a live scenario, it's easier to break that fourth wall. Now, on the film, there are instances where the actors will break the fourth wall and address the audience. However, I feel like it's harder to do that seamlessly because when you go in to watch a film, there are already assumptions that you as a 21st century viewer are bringing in. When you come to watch a movie on, on in the theaters or on Netflix, you are going there to sit, to observe, to listen, not necessarily to interact. There's an emotional and intellectual distance between what you are doing here in the room and what you're viewing on a screen. However, in the endowment, it is meant to be a very immersive experience. You are participating in this drama. This is a story about you. You are Eve or you are Adam. You fall into this world and you've made mistakes, but you use the atonement of Jesus Christ to overcome those challenges and enter back into Heavenly Father's presence. And so when you're in a live endowment ceremony, you've got the actors talking to you and interacting with you as well as interacting with each other as if they're in a, some sort of play. And personally, I really love that. I feel as a woman that I can identify more with Eve as the mother of all living because not only is she acting on screen and being a participant in that way, but when she's in a live endowment, she is officiating for me. She is the mother of all living, is leading me and guiding me through each step of this process. She is in a sense an escort for the women participants in the endowment ceremony. She leads them from room to room. She helps officiate in certain parts of the ritual. And it's an absolutely beautiful thing to re-picture Eve, not just as this character, but as me. And not just as me, but as the person helping me through the ceremony. She's the mother of all living. She's my guide. She's my mentor and someone I can look up to as a divine feminine figure. In addition to identifying with Adam and Eve more, I also feel like I can identify with God my father more when I'm in a live endowment experience. I feel a greater intimate connection with my God when he's right there standing before me metaphorically, symbolically, as a temple worker. Because again, there's less emotional and physical and mental distance than when someone is on a screen. Not only that, but God participates more in the ritual aspect of this. I find that a very special experience and just a really awe-inspiring one that God is personally ministering to me and covenanting with me. And another thing I love is the diversity of actors you get. So with the film diversion, they clearly, you know, auditioned these actors. They're very good in their roles. Whereas in the live endowment version, the actors are just the temple workers that day. And so you get a whole variety of people in these roles that all add their own flavor and their own interpretation to the ritual text. And I think it's so cool. It makes me question my assumptions about what I think God should look like or what he should act like, what he should sound like, 
And I've loved my experiences every time having a new person, a new face, be the face of God for me, or be the face of Adam and Eve, or all those other characters as well. Now, apart from the ritual drama aspect of the endowment, where I feel like you can connect with those characters more, there's another major factor of the live endowment that I think really brings out some of the cool messages of the endowment ceremony, and that's the concept of heavenly ascent. And we have gone over this concept in another video, so if you haven't uh, already you want to check out my video on the mountain of the Lord. But temples all over the world do try to replicate this idea of a heavenly ascent in various ways, but I think it comes out most concretely and tangibly in these live endowment ceremony temples, like the pioneer temples of Salt Lake, Manti, uh, Los Angeles, Alberta. They have these progressive room structures. So what I'm referring to is in the ancient world, in ancient scripture, there's a concept of heavenly ascent, that you would ascend the mountain of the Lord, you would go up to a sacred hill to commune with God and enter into his presence and receive sacred knowledge from him. The ancient Israelite temple tried to mimic this as well. One of the functions of the ancient Israelite temple was to undo the effects of the fall. So just as the fall caused a descent from God's presence, the Israelite temple was supposed to reconcile us back to God. In other words, help us ascend back to Heavenly Father. And they did this in various ways, but one way they did that is through their architecture. Each successive area of the temple was a successive increase in holiness and often an increase in elevation or height. You'd start out in the courtyard where more people could congregate and gather, and then only certain people were allowed into the holy place of the temple after you'd step up a few steps. And after that, only the high priest was admitted into the Holy of Holies after, again, stepping up a few steps, kind of representing this ascension to God and an increase in holiness. And temples all over the world today try to mimic this. Temples do this by having progressive rooms. And now many temples with films will only have one or two rooms that you progress through. However, others will have three, such as an instruction room, a terrestrial room, and then a celestial room. Other temples that had a live endowment format had like five different rooms that you would progress through, and they would each have an increase in elevation, representing this increase in holiness, this heavenly ascent back to God's presence, ultimately represented by the celestial room. So like in the Salt Lake Temple, for example, you start out in the creation room with the creation of the world in Adam and Eve, the garden room where you have the fall narrative taking place, the world room where Adam and Eve learn to resist Satan, the terrestrial room where they've learned to overcome through the atonement of Jesus Christ, and finally they enter into the presence of God into the celestial room. And so I love that in these pioneer temples, they put such detail into their artistry and into the furnishings to really evoke these different stages that you were progressing through and this feeling of heavenly ascent that you're going up different staircases to finally reach the upper levels of the temple where the celestial room is. And it's a beautiful experience. And you may notice in some of these pioneer temples, there are beautiful, intricate murals on the walls. Some more modern temples will have murals too, but their function is primarily aesthetic, to set the mood and give a vibe to help you feel like you're experiencing this primordial narrative. However, in these live endowment ceremonies, the murals are not just aesthetic, they are very functional. For example, in the Manti temple, the murals on the wall in the creation room essentially serve the function of what the film does for us today. In, in the filmed endowment, you have beautiful images and footage of God creating the earth and the mountains and the rivers and the plants and the animals, etc. And they're just lovely imagery. In the live endowment ceremony, they wouldn't have those special effects. And so they try to evoke the same thing through these images on the wall. And in fact, in the Manti temple, you'll notice that the images on the creation room wall exactly mirror the progression of the endowment ceremony. It'll start off with just like this globe in the front of the room when God is talking about, let us go down and create a world. And then you can follow along the narrative and you can also simultaneously look around the room and it spirals around you as God progressively creates uh, earth and mountains and then rivers and then the sun, moon and stars and then plant life and then finally animal life and then finally man. And man is the only thing not depicted in the creation room wall. Instead, it's everything else on the first five days of creation. 
What I love about the live endowment is the sense of anticipation and like dramatic suspense in getting to meet God and these characters for the first time. In the film's version, you see the characters of God pretty early on as he's creating the earth and talking to Jehovah. He's speaking and you can see their figures in this film. However, in the live endowment ceremony, the creators of the earth are behind a veil. They're, they're obscured and hidden and you're just hearing their voices from behind a curtain while you're just looking at these murals and hearing them describe the creation they are performing. It is not until the sixth day when it is time to create man that they are finally revealed. They say, okay, it's time to create man. And then the temple workers who represent God the Father, God the Son, and Adam come forth from behind a curtain and they stand before you and Adam sits in a chair. And I love it because we are creating Adam and Adam was made in the image of God. And so finally, after all the other elements of creation are completed, we finally get to see the image of our creator. And as it happens to be, our creator looks like us. Another way that the murals are functional is in the garden room. The garden room is where uh, the Garden of Eden is and where the fall narrative takes place. And on the garden room walls, you'll have paintings of various trees, including the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so in the narrative, the characters will actually interact with these paintings on the wall. Satan may reach over and pretend to grab a fruit from this painting, or God may gesture over to the tree of life in his lines. And now the world room is really cool because it's supposed to evoke this sense of uh, either loneliness or dreariness or that this is a fallen place that is distinct from the garden and from creation. And you definitely get that sense in these pioneer temples. Now this was my first time actually doing an endowment in the Manti Temple. I had done Salt Lake quite a few times but I'd never gotten down to do the Manti Temple and I really really loved these murals. They were gorgeous and I loved the world room because usually when we think of the temple, it's this otherworldly sort of uh, aesthetic. And so the lone and dreary world in other temples tends to be more nature scenes, but they just look barren or dead or something like that. And I love that in the Manti Temple, it is very crowded. It's got depictions of people from all over the earth, all over different points in history, doing various things, being humans, interacting as the human race to kind of give the sense that even though we're kind of seeing Adam and Eve as these lone characters, they really aren't alone because as I mentioned, this story is about them, but it's also about us. We are to see ourselves as Adam and Eve and we are interacting in a vast world full of busyness, full of chaos, full of varying influences of people trying to purchase things for money, people trying to preach the philosophies of men mingled with scripture. And I love it because it gives this sense of Oh, if I'm really a true covenant keeper, I have to learn how to covenant keep amidst chaos, not just amidst being in a lone and dreary nature landscape. I've got to learn how to be in the world, but not of the world. And then the terrestrial room in all the pioneer temples I've been to does try to evoke this otherworldliness. The, it's the idea that you have overcome, that the atonement is helping you repent and gain grace, gain salvation, and you are no longer in the world, you are transcending the world, and you are preparing to enter into God's presence. And then finally, the celestial room is the most grand and luxurious and brilliant room in the entire temple because it represents the presence of God. So I know I've been rambling on for a long time. So just to kind of wrap things up, I think the live endowment is precious. And I wish that every member of the church could have an opportunity to experience it at least once. So they could get a sense of, you know, how it was initially intended to be experienced before then transitioning to film. But as I mentioned, I support the brethren. I support the First Presidency and I sustain them in their decisions. I know there are a lot of challenges. One of the main challenges they mentioned in their statement was that it's just difficult to staff these temples. And it's true. Like I mentioned, you've got like two hours of dialogue to memorize if you're one of these temple workers. And they've got to staff that for every single session. And it's hard to staff those sessions in English. You can also imagine how difficult it is to do that in other languages as well. And not just people resources, but space. Live endowment ceremonies take up a lot of space because like I said, you're progressing through five different rooms and you can't have all five of those rooms filled at once. You need to space them out. And so getting enough people through a session 
to be efficient can be really challenging when you're doing a live endowment format. The filmed version allows the church to correlate, to kind of standardize the experience for all members of the church. As much as I love the endowment experience live, it's something that only members of the church in Utah really get to experience. And so it makes sense the church would want to make a fair and egalitarian experience for members all over the world. Speaking of all over the world, it is infinitely easier to translate the endowment into different languages when you're just talking about doing it once and then distributing it through film as opposed to having a whole cast of actors in every single language every single time it needs to be performed. That's a lot. President Nelson has also indicated that he is not opposed to making changes to the endowment. 2019 we saw changes, 2020 we saw major changes, and I don't doubt that we'll see more in the future. And making those changes is a lot easier to do when you're editing a film with voiceover narration as opposed to asking actors all over the world to re-memorize lines over and over and over again. I love the live endowment ceremony. It resonates with me. It is my kind of ceremony. It uh, helps me better associate and connect myself with the characters and see myself in their shoes. It helps me envision this as a ritual drama better. The live endowment progression of room to room helps me visualize that heavenly ascent back to God in a more tangible way. And it helps me just feel part of the covenant community as we are all interacting together. So there you have it. I hope this video has helped those of you who have gone through a live endowment before and maybe thought it was strange, or those who haven't and wish they had, or maybe those who never have but thought the endowment itself was a little awkward or stilted. Hopefully this all helps bring some of it into context as I ramble on, and uh, I'll see you guys next time.